<clears throat> am, I, am I broadcasting? I am? Yeah? Okay, because, oh, okay, well. Well, hi. <laughs> Welcome to our Sunday morning class. Uh, you've still got a little time to uh, text your friends, send them a message, tell them that this is happening, tell them to check it out later, invite them to come to worship with you virtually or in person at 1030 today. Now, while we are getting started, I want to say something to all of our friends in uh, the River Valley, Fort Smith area. Well, you know, if you're further out than that and you want to make the drive today and come to uh, Christmas cheer and carols, you can do that. We'll tell you more about that at the 10:30 uh, moment. But it's it, this. This. Let me give you what I know about it. We're all going to gather in the parking lot in our cars. It's like drive-in Christmas caroling. Okay, uh, think of a drive-in theater where everybody's showing up to Christmas carol. And we're gonna we're gonna encourage everybody. That starts at 5 p.m. Just being able to see one another from the safety of our vehicles, um, I think, is going to be a real encouragement. Plus, you know that this is going on, and um, I think it's going to be nice to commit ourselves to something that's going to be absolutely positive and a blessing, and uh, it'll be cheerful for all. I told you last week that we are going to uh, study the Christmas story, and uh, the Christmas stories show up in two of our Gospels, and last week we did um, Matthew, and this week I want to take a look at Luke's version of the story. So we'll uh, head on over there to Luke 1, and we're real informal because I'm going to take a drink of coffee, 11 of you are out there, and You're probably still in your pajamas. It's okay. For those of you who are up here at the building in your pajamas, we need to talk later. So, Um, all right. Luke one. Now, Matthew's uh, telling of this Christmas um, story or the birth of Jesus, to be more accurate, is um, it's a, he's he's indicating to us through the person of Joseph and through the the genealogy that includes some stories, references some stories, where there's a theme that the people who appear to be righteous, the people that we would think are the ones who are definitely God's servants, are not always the righteous ones. And it's the ones who get looked down upon, the ones who the world dismisses, who are the ones that please God. Now, that was the, kind of what was wrapped up in, um, in Matthew's first two chapters. And one of the uh, individuals that he really intended to put in a spotlight was Herod the Great and the evil that Herod the Great had done. But Matthew also connected all of this to the history of God's people. And if there's, if there's one common theme to the the stories in both Matthew and Luke, or one common characteristic, I'd rather say it like that. If there's one common characteristic to both of these uh, Gospels and their telling of the story of the birth of Christ, it is that what happens in the birth of Jesus is consistent with what God has done in the past. So imagine that you're talking to your uh, financial advisor uh, your stockbroker, and uh, they always want to tell you, look, this stock has performed this well over time, this stock has performed this well over time, and then they always say, now, past performance is not an indicator of uh, you know, future success. They make sure you know that because a lawyer has told them to say that. And, um, and it's true. It's a true statement. But with the Gospels and the story of Jesus... Past performance is an indicator of future intent and future success. There's no asterisk in God's story. What you've seen him do before is what you will see him do again. And you will see him do it again and again. And Luke rings this bell quite loudly. 
Um, I want to start reading in Luke, and I'm going to read selected uh, chapters to emphasize a few things because we, um, you know, we, we, we've got about mm, less than an hour here, and so we're going to fly over this territory. Now, uh, notice that Luke starts out giving you the intent of what he's doing. He says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the, who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. If you ever, get, if you ever study in Luke and Acts and you get sidetracked and you're wondering, what does this mean? What is this about? Go back to this opening statement. It will tell you what Luke has in mind That's why studying Luke's gospel, Luke's writings, um, are so rewarding because you do not have to figure out what the author's intent was. He states it clearly right at the beginning. He's wanting to write an orderly account so that we may know the certainty of the things we've been taught. Now, the first part of the story opens up. In the time of Herod, the king of Judea, we've met him in Matthew's gospel, there was a priest named Zechariah. In Matthew's gospel, Herod gets some spotlight. In Luke's gospel, Herod is nothing more than a time reference. He's important, he's historical, and Luke says he's not an eyewitness. So we're moving on. But this places what happens here somewhere between 37 to 4 B.C. And uh, the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, where uh, Zechariah is one of the priests... And he and his wife, they are, um, they are advanced in years. That's the kind biblical way of saying that they're old. And, uh, they, uh, but they don't have any children. And that's, that's tragic for them in their culture. And, and because not having any children means that they have no heir. They have no one to take care of them. They have no one to uh, see to them. Now, Instantly, that should remind you of other biblical stories, right? And the one that obviously comes to mind is the one that Luke wants you to hear, Abraham and Sarah. Here you have a couple that have no future. And they are people who please God and serve God and are doing what God wants. And so, keeping with the pattern, they get a visitation from an an angel. And in Luke, he names this angel. Uh, Notice that in verse 19, the angel says to Zechariah, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Now, the good news here is the good news that they're going to have a child. So there's a good news that leads up to an even greater good news, and that'll be John's life. Um, Gabriel tells Zechariah that he's going to have to learn to uh, be quiet uh, because he'll, he'll not be able to speak until the day that this happens because he did not believe his words. Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and goes out to speak on behalf of God, he, he expects to be believed be, because of who he represents and where he comes from. And so... He's, I, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know Gabriel's biography. I don't know that we have a lot of uh, information on Gabriel other than this. But I imagine it's, it's stunning. And, and, you know, he gets the idea that um, people are, are stunned by his presence. Mary's going to be stunned by his presence. But once he tells them not to be afraid and tells them, what, you know, who he represents, you'd think at that point, hey, look, we know this story. We know about angels of the Lord that go out and talk to people. Th- this, this ought to be like, flashing the badge of authority and saying, okay, you're going to do what I say, right? But of course, it's a priest. It's Zechariah that has to fuss with this. You um, uh, go back a few verses and um, you'll notice that Zechariah in verse 18 says, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Now, Zechariah asks the question that Sarah asks in Genesis 18. So Zechariah is um, responding in the questionable, faithless, doubting way that Sarah did in Genesis. 
So if you ever catch anybody using the Abraham and Sarah story to say, see, Sarah, she's not, she's not all that because uh, she can't believe, and it's because she's a woman, stop them right there and say, okay, now wait a second. Zechariah does the same thing. And furthermore, Zechariah ought to know better. He's a priest. He knows these stories. He's serving in God's presence. He's serving in God's presence. Gabriel comes from God's presence. Gabriel sort of looks at him like, look, you know, aren't we in the same business, more or less? Different head department, I get it, you know, different lo- headquarters, location. But aren't we more or less in the same business? We intercede on behalf of others and God. Zechariah is meeting his heavenly uh, opposite number. Gabriel goes and represents God. Zechariah represents the people before God. This should be an easy meeting. But Zechariah can't accept it, so he's going to go through a learning process. But this is very much like the Abraham and Sarah story. So many things might be changed and a little different. But again, let me break this down for you. There's going to be a visitation of an angel in each of these stories. There's going to be the promise of a child, which represents good news. And there's going to be an end to disgrace, an end to being barren, an end to hopelessness. That the birth of that child represents all of those things. You can also um, compare what is happening here to another story. That of Abraham's grandson, Jacob, and his wife, Rachel. Uh, Jacob has other children with Leah and with the, uh, the handmaidens of Leah and Rachel. But it takes the intervention of God and the action of God, the promise of God for Rachel to have a child. And that child, Joseph, will become the means through which the people of Jacob are rescued. Okay, that's in uh, the later chapters of Genesis. Um, Notice that in verse 25 of chapter 1, Elizabeth becomes pregnant. For five months she remains in seclusion. She says, the Lord has done this for me. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. That's an important line. The idea that this is God showing favor. God is pleased. You know, um, I hope that this, there's, there's so much more we can draw out, but I hope this simple little phrase can draw out this idea that the Old Testament God is sort of a, um, you know, there's this myth out there that the Old Testament God is this angry, um, abusive God you, if you dare to wake him up or upset him, he's going to get mad. He's going to flood your crops. He's going to kill your cattle. He's going, to, he's going to just tear things up. You just don't want to mess with that Old Testament God. He's always angry and cranky. And then he has a child and his heart softens like the Grinch. Okay. You can see right here that God is always interested in sharing favor and And these moments are not rare. In verse uh, 28, the angel goes to Mary and says, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Um, And by the way, if you think, well, this is New Testament now, Benjamin. This is New Testament. This is is where God kind of changes. Is it? Because Luke is drawing from stories where this has happened before. Um, Let's go back just a second to verse 25. Elizabeth is uh, six months along now in her pregnancy, and God sends the angel Gabriel to Nazareth. A town in Galilee sends Gabriel to a virgin, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. Uh, Luke and Matthew agree on the facts. They emphasize different facts, but they agree on the facts. Matthew emphasizes Joseph. Luke's going to emphasize Mary. But these um, other items, like uh, Joseph being a descendant of David, um, Mary being a virgin, they're important because this keys in references 
Her being a virgin brings Isaiah 7 to the forefront and that prophecy. Uh, Joseph being a descendant of David brings to the forefront all the promises to David and his descendants. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, if you want to engage in your own study, you know, in a devotional, let's say, for this week leading up to Christmas Day, it would be interesting to go through this and to note all the references that are packed into these phrases. Um, you're to call him Jesus. The name Jesus means he saves, it means salvation, it means deliverance. You remember that when we were looking at the laments earlier this year, there's always mention of God's deliverance or God's salvation. The choice of that name is not random. It doesn't just sound good. Uh, God didn't assemble a marketing group in heaven and say, you know, what's a good name that goes with Christ? Uh, you know, let's run a few, let's run a few options across there. It needs to be two syllables. We like the idea of it starting with a J. It it, it doesn't, that, that's not the key. The name has meaning and it has to do with salvation. It has to do with rescue. Um, he'll be called son of the most high. That's a, that, that'll take you a little while to figure out what that means. I mean, why most high? Why the most high God? I mean, there's a lot of other titles and names for God. Why this one? Uh, there's, there's a lot to that. Um, so I'm going to leave that with you. Uh, the, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. David's his father. Wait a second. Isn't there a whole debate about that, that Jesus is before David, but David... Okay, well, what does this mean? Well, to understand that, you have to have at least some appreciation for royal lineage. And between Matthew and Luke, you can see that... Um, Royal lineage means something, but at the same time, God can completely skirt around it. Think about it like this. David ascends to the throne. The throne of Israel is already in place when David is anointed king. Now, usually you ascend to the throne because your father was the king. That's not true of David. Saul was the king, and God says, that's it. We're finding someone else. God is always in charge of who sits on that throne. It's always God's call. And that's why the one who sits on that throne is often referred to as the Son of God. His human lineage is interesting, but it's not the ultimate cause for why someone is entitled to rule. This is also why the birth of Jesus to a virgin matters. Mary's going to conceive. Now, we need to break away from some of the old ancient myths. You know, you have all these Greek myths where, um, you know, the gods, uh, whatever they are, they're kind of like uh, divine superheroes, kind of a, uh, and they're, they're, they're usually a, a problematic bunch. I mean, they've, they've got all kinds of dysfunctions. And, uh, and then one of them sees some human woman and, you know, thinks, you know, well, this is kind of nice, and he goes down, you know, spends, spends some time down on earth, enters into a relationship, and, you know, then he finds out, you know, you've, you've fathered a child, whoa, you know, can't have the old lady hearing about this, and so, you know, he does something to, to hide it, and, you know, and here we get Hercules, you know, oh boy, and there's a lot of different stories about that, these hero myths, I mean, even if you watch that Percy Jackson stuff, that's, you know, it's, it's all in there, but, you know, you've got this divine uh, Greek hero, God of a father, human people having children. Throw all that aside when it comes to the story of Mary, okay? Because there is no relationship like that. God has given His Holy Spirit 
to numerous individuals over history to accomplish his purposes. Saul isn't much of a king until the Holy Spirit descends upon him and gives him a sense of justice. And then he does an act that makes him worthy uh, to be Israel's king. Samson, as long as he is obedient to God and his hair grows, is given the Spirit to have incredible strength. And he does so to defend and to liberate and save God's people. Uh, we, I, can, I can continue to list examples, but think about that. Even the prophets are empowered by the Spirit to speak a word. Uh, Solomon is empowered by God's Spirit to have wisdom so that he can rule and judge. Mary is empowered by God's Spirit to be a mother. Even though the natural process of conception has not taken place. So this isn't some kind of divine conception uh, where God is doing some sort of heavenly version of artificial insemination or anything like that. Mary, let, let's read Luke's words. The angel, here it's coming straight from the home office, uh, Gabriel says, The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. That language of the, of the power of the Spirit coming on someone and being overshadowed by the power of the Most High, that's not unique to Mary. We read similar language of these other agents who are used to accomplish God's purposes. What God needs now, though, is not somebody who can just jump higher, run faster, hit harder, outthink, outsmart, outdo everybody else. He needs someone who can allow him to come among us for salvation's purposes. And this is why Mary is chosen. And since she is a virgin, then this is definitely the Son of God. And that's the meaning of that term again. He is truly in every way, the heir to God's rule and God's authority. Okay, <clears throat> Mary, in verse 38, and I don't think she does this lightly, but she is, um, you know, she is troubled at the words. She's wondering what's going on. She resolves in verse 38 to say these words, I am the Lord's servant. And every person that we read about who does well to uh, save God's people at some point says, I am your servant. David is the best king he can be when he is God's servant. Solomon is the best king he can be when he is God's servant. When any of the judges or any of the prophets or any of the people of God are his servant, they do well. It's when they stop being God's servant and serve themselves that things go wrong. Okay, in verse 39, Mary uh, hurries to a town in the hill country of Judea. She goes to Zechariah's home and she greets Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed. Now notice, Elizabeth is now empowered by the Holy Spirit. Not to be pregnant like Mary, that's already happened. She's empowered to speak a word that needs to be spoken here. And by the way, let me just pause right here and, and ask you this. Where's Luke getting all this? Go back to the introduction. What did he say? Just, I, I've, I've undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Well, somebody has told Luke this story. Now, he says it's an eyewitness. It's somebody who was there. I wonder, and I'm not, okay, if I could <clears throat> do instant cap captions, I would, I would be putting speculation, speculation, speculation right here, okay? So there, you fill it in yourself, write it on a magic marker. I wonder, and I've often wondered, if one of the people that Luke interviews is Mary. 
Could he have interviewed Mary? I'm getting a thumbs up. Uh, yeah, he could have. It's very possible. Uh, would, it, would it be good for him to have done so? Well, of course. Now, I need a little more evidence. I mean, right now, that's just a possibility. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know that I can prove this 100% and be dogmatic. I don't know that it, it really matters. But if you look at 2.19, in Luke 2.19, we continue on these stories and the things that Mary and Joseph experience with this child. And then we're given this line, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. I don't know about you, but that sounds like Luke's way of saying, Mary, thank you for writing a diary. I can use this in my research. You're saying, wait, Mary's got a diary out there? What if we ever uncover? No, Mary doesn't have a literal diary. She's treasuring this in her heart. This is her story. This is her testimony. And I think that's where Luke is getting a lot of this. Now, it's just me. If you tell me, you know, if somebody wants to argue and say, well, no, I think he got it from... Uh, you know, one of the other disciples who got it from Jesus himself, or maybe he got it from uh, Jesus' brother. Fine, that's fine. All I know is Luke is getting this from eyewitnesses. But this gives me a certain respect in reading this word to know that um, a lot of these things are written with an intimacy and they're written with detail that make you think, wow, this is probably Mary's recollection of what it was like that day when her cousin Elizabeth, you know, she's just going to find a place where she can rest and get a little help uh, because she's not, she's not married to Joseph yet. She needs somebody to take care of her. She needs people. And instead, she gets this song, this proclamation, and Elizabeth says, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? There's the idea of favor again. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Mary needed a blessing. Mary needed a word of comfort, a word of assurance, a word of promise. Even Mary needs the good news. Mary's not the good news. Mary doesn't get to write the good news. She needs it herself, and she's getting it from Elizabeth. And so Mary breaks into song. My soul glorifies the Lord. I bet we're going to sing this in worship today. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Now, that's a real flowery language to say, wow, God pays attention to Poor, young, unimportant folks like me. He hadn't forgotten about me. Notice that when it came to Herod, Luke in the story says, now in the days when Herod was king, get him off the stage, move on. But Herod, he, oh, we don't care about Herod. Yeah, but Herod, ah, he's not important. Now this girl, this girl living over here up in the hill country, Way outside the city. Now, she matters. Oh, let's, let's find out her story. And Luke, if you'll notice, he's, he's taking eyewitness accounts then from people that to us matter. You know, the great, oh, Mary and Peter, James and John. But in their day and in their age, they were, they were people that the world would have considered nobody of importance. And Mary gets that. Mary gets that. She gets that she has been overshadowed and wrapped up and drawn in to the purposes of God. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. To be mindful of her in her humble estate means that God didn't overlook her. He didn't look down on her. In fact, he exalts her. And that's exactly what the good news will be about. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. And by the way, that, that's not Mary assuming some throne here. Aha, as of this day now, all of you will call me blessed. You got it? I'm Mary. I'm the mother of God. Let's know where things stand. This is Mary expressing immense gratitude. She is in awe of this. How does she? 
Yeah, remember, she's, she's coming off of what Elizabeth said. Elizabeth says, um, why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And Mary, in a sense, is saying, oh, you're not the one who's favored. You're not even favored nearly as much as I'm favored. And by the way, favored is nothing to brag about. Favored is 100% a gift. Favored is all about grace. You know, it, it's, it's, it's like meeting somebody very important, a celebrity, and they say, well, I'm honored to meet you. Oh, not half as honored as I am. Mary's saying, I'm going to be remembered, and I, I am someone who comes from the hill country. I'm a young girl. I mean, I, how did I get here? So her statement that from now on people will call me blessed, she knows why. It's not because of me. It's because the mighty one has done great things, notice who she says, for me. Holy is his name. She knows that she is the first recipient of God's amazing grace. She is the first recipient of favor. This does not elevate her to some status to where she gets to pull rank on all the other uh, you know, folks down here on earth. She's saying, I am the first of many who will receive this amazing, awesome gift of grace. Well, uh, reading what Mary sings there and recalls to us Another one of these stories of the birth of a child that matters, and that's in 1 Samuel chapter 2. We read about Hannah, who gives birth to Samuel. And so far, if you just kind of track through the, the indicators here, you've got Abraham and Sarah, Jacob and Rachel. The appearance of the angel of the Lord reminds us of Judges 13, where you have Samson's parents, Manoah and Mrs. Manoah, and uh, her name's not in Scripture. But anyway, but you, you always have this, this pattern of this visitation from an angel of the Lord, the promise of a child, and then the birth of that child having something to do with resurrection, or not resurrection, salvation, and it has something to do with redemption and, and uh, deliverance. And so... This keys into all of that, and Luke has, has taken every, every crayon of every color that takes us back to that, and he has uh, drawn us a word picture with that. Now we get Hannah into the mix. Mary is a lot like Hannah. She humbles herself. She submits herself to God. She becomes God's servant, and God uses this to save and deliver his people. Um, at the birth of John the Baptist. And by the way, Luke gives us a twofer. You show up in Luke and you're thinking, oh, this is good. Luke's going to do just like Matthew. He's going to give us the story of the, the birth of Jesus Christ. Luke says, I'll tell you what, now am I going to do that? I'm going to tell you about John the Baptist too. John the Baptist, we get to hear about, wow, you know, I mean, okay. So we get a twofer, we get two stories. The birth of John the Baptist, other than what Sight and Sound up in Branson did at Miracle of Christmas, you know, you just don't, you don't get a lot of that, it seems like, you know. Everybody wants to skip ahead to John the Baptist, you know, and he's all Duck Dynasty out there with his beard and everything, you know. Repent, you know, and he, and he cricket legs hanging in his beard and everything. That's what everybody's looking for. But, but he, the story of, of his birth is God doing the same thing? I mean, if God's done it before, and he's going to do it this time, can't you see where his power is just going to spill over, and Zechariah and Elizabeth are going to get included in this as well? And that gives Zechariah, Zechariah gets his speech back, and he sings a song in verse 67. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel. Why? Because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Do you see the themes that keep coming over and over again? There is the theme of royalty. There is the theme of rule. Just like David, who will rule his people. This is the hope of these people. But this goes even beyond that. Notice that Zechariah brings back the... Uh, 
the mention of the Holy Covenant. Uh, verse 72, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. Thank you. Zechariah understands what Abraham's been through. To rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Now Zechariah blesses uh, John. You, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. Does that sound like anything you've ever heard before? Look up Isaiah 40. Sure. This is what Mark opens his gospel with. Um, He says of his child, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God. In other words, God is not the angry monster who is so annoyed with us that he has a hair trigger temper and he wants to just destroy us and he would if Jesus Christ weren't holding him back. That is a myth. That is a far more dangerous myth than any of those silly Greek stories that have turned into Percy Jackson. You know, if anybody wants to go get upset by Harry Potter, you need to be upset about this false idea of God who just cannot wait to put us to the torch. He's a merciful God. He's a forgiving God. His mercy and His forgiveness is costly. But He is a God who intends to save. We're troublemakers, yes. And we have caused some problems, yes. But God is not going to let that be the last chapter of the story. I think sometimes in our arrogance, we think that we're going to destroy everything, and I think we need some humbling there, and God will say, no, you're not. Why? Because I won't allow it, says God. The child grew and became strong in spirit. This is verse 80. And he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. Now, that's a very similar statement to what's said of Jesus. Uh, that he grew in stature and wisdom. And it's also very similar to what's said of Samuel, who is sort of the, the, the really, other than Moses, the first of the prophets for Israel. And, and Israel likes its prophets because the prophets are the leaders who lead Israel religiously but also remind people of what God uh, is saying and doing. Now, we did all that to get to what is the classic story, verse uh, chapter 2. And notice that he's going to um, bring up these, these very important historical people just to give you a time stamp. In the days of Caesar Augustus, or in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Don't we need to know those people, Luke? Luke says, no. Because they weren't eyewitnesses. They weren't servants of the word. Yeah, they're out there. But we don't need to know who they are. You know who they are. Some of us are saying, well, we don't know who they are. Because we're not Romans. Luke says, don't worry about it. Let me tell you who's important. Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea. To Bethlehem, the town of David. Because he belonged to the house and the line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's the Messiah. He's the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Do you see the theme again? When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. People are getting a visitation. It's just kind of spilling over. Not only does angel Gabriel show up to Mary, angel Gabriel shows up 
to Zechariah. Zechariah and Elizabeth share in this blessing. They share in this favor. Mary's sharing in this favor. But it won't even stop there. Now the angels show up and say, we have a special announcement. Now this may be the thing that you haven't seen it's like quite before. Okay? And the people that they show up to are the shepherds. And we all know why they show up to the shepherds, right? Because, you know, the sheep are so... Uh, Amazingly cute, and we need that because this is a sentimental tale. No, these are cowboys. These are, these, these are people that, that, that handle dirty animals, okay? They're, they're, they're rough. They're, you know, they're really not that important. You don't let them come walking into the palace or anything like that. These are day laborers. These are people who are not important to anyone. And that's where God decides to shed a little favor why not David is the shepherd king he's the one who is a shepherd he's the one who gets recognized over all the great and mighty in Saul's household so you have finally this not only the angel and individuals but now it's earth and heaven this is a moment in history you know we're all getting pretty excited because if you come to um, uh, Christmas cheer and carols tonight, um, tomorrow night at CR, they've got kind of a, a special story about um, the birth of Christ. And one of the things is right around that time frame, that's when you're going to be able to see the Christmas star in the sky right now. You know, that this is the first time in 800 years when Jupiter and Saturn are closer than ever before. Uh, I'm not entirely sure where you see it and how you see it. I know it has something to do about that same time frame, but you can look that up, and if you want to bring binoculars tonight or whatever, that's fine. But here's the thing. As impressive and as exciting as that is, all right? Now, don't, don't lose me here. Don't go off trying to Google when the Christmas star appears. As, as exciting and as impressive as that is, this moment the barrier between heaven and earth is wide open. This is Jacob's ladder to the power of 10,000. This is, there's, there's no barrier. The angels are singing, extending favor, special announcement. The shepherds are you know, filled with fear, but then they get excited saying, something has happened here, we need to go check this out. And they're not afraid to approach the king, the one who is the, the, the link between heaven and earth. So, <laughs> um, let's leave it with these shepherds, because these shepherds, they, 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 they hurried off. Uh, in Arkansas, we'd say they runned off. They runned off and found Mary and Joseph. That's all one word. And the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. You know, I think one of the other people that Luke could have interviewed is one of those shepherds. He could have. But the gospel message begins, the, the, the first evangelists are these characters who are out there tending sheep. Not some, you know, grand pastoral thing. I mean, they're out there, you know, picking ticks off these critters and, you know, trying to clean them up and keep them from falling in a ditch. And those guys get to be our first evangelists. Now, that's God's favor. That's God's mercy. And you, ha and you have to appreciate how God does all this. The shepherds return glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. When it comes right down to it, and you and I are wondering, you know, well, okay, so we've got this Christmas story. What are we supposed to do with it? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to tell others about it? It's pretty simple. Just glorify and praise God for all the things that you've heard and seen, especially the parts that are just like you were told it was going to be. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for Luke who gives us this eyewitness account. 
that we know that there's a story that gives all of our lives meaning, that we're visited by favor. Your favor and your mercy are heaped upon us. And Lord, sometimes we don't realize that. We, we go through a year like 2020, and we think that we're hated, despised. We become angry. We become upset. Um, some of us who are on the fence of saying there is no God, boy, this is all it took. And Father, we just don't have enough to remind us, or we don't pay attention to what ought to remind us that we are blessed, favored, shown mercy, forgiven. I pray that at this holiday season this week, you'll help us to share this word, not in a sugary candy stick way but father to do so in a way where we recognize the terrifying but loving reality that our creator has spared nothing to save us father we pray this and we thank you for this word in jesus name amen we'll see you in worship in about 15 minutes thank you